Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, my, we'll go ahead and get started now with our next session. My name is Kim Robine, and I'm an associate professor at the Milken Institute School of Public Health at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. I'm also a registered dietitian and oncology nutrition uh, specialist. Um, I'm a member of the workshop planning committee, and I'm going to be the moderator for this next session, which is going to be on models of care in oncology nutrition, both from the U.S. and from the international perspective. Um, I, I just want to take one second to mention that we have over 200 uh, participants participating via webcast right now. So very exciting. For those of you who are online, we actually have more of you online than in the room, which is a very exciting trend for us. So welcome to all of you who are online. So um, I hope um, you've all been able to join us for the earlier session. We just had a wonderful overview of the nutrition issues that individuals face during cancer treatment and in the longer term as cancer survivors. In this session, we're going to change gears just a bit, and we're going to review how dietetic and oncology nutrition services are provided in various oncology um, settings. I'm going to introduce our two speakers right now in the interest of time to give them the most time to give their presentation. So our first presenter will be Roan Levin, who's been a registered dietitian for 24 years. Um, I just have to share that I was in the dietetic internship class at the University of Wisconsin the year behind her, so that gives me um, a, a little uh, a, a number of years that I've been in the field. Um, and she has definitely specialized throughout her career in oncology nutrition. She is a board certified um, specialist in oncology nutrition, and she's currently the oncology nutrition uh, and oncology nutrition diet uh, dietitian at the Dell Children's Medical Center in Austin, Texas. Um, our second speaker is Liz Eisenring. We're very excited to have her joining us all the way from Australia. I think she gets the prize for the speaker who came the furthest for our presentation. We're just thrilled that she came all the way to join us today. Uh, Liz is professor and head of program in the Faculty of Health Sciences and Medicine at Bond University in Australia. She's an internationally recognized in the areas of oncology nutrition, nutrition in older adults, Adults, nutrition screening and assessment. Uh, Dr. Eisenring is the nutrition section editor for Current Oncology and associate editor for Nutrition and Dietetics. And I'd also like to add that she chairs the Nutrition and Cachexia Study Group for the Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer. So with that, I will turn our presentation over to Ron, our first speaker. All right, well, thank you. Um, can everybody hear okay? So my name is Rome Levin, and I um, am a board-certified oncology dietitian, and I just wanted to comment on the, the uh, frequency that you're hearing the words from the trenches, <laughs> working from the trenches, and I just think that's actually an interesting concept as we talk about what it's like to, pr to work in the um, outpatient or inpatient oncology center. Um, so before we get started, um, I did want to just give a, take a moment and just thank some of the um, uh, people who have created and worked really hard towards creating the profession of oncology nutrition, starting with Kim Rabin, um, who set up uh, kind of the framework, um, as well as Barbara Grant, um, set up the framework of how we can move this profession forward. Um, and then the group, the Oncology Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group, which is a part of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, has, through a, uh, a number of very dedicated volunteers, very passionate volunteers, been able to move this profession forward. And, um, and then moving towards uh, thanking Elaine Trujillo, whose vision um, has moved this discussion where we're chasing our tail, <laughs> talking to other dietitians, talking to other nutrition professionals about this problem, out to the broader medical community. Um, so when I first started in oncology practice, one of the things that was very evident to me was that there was a paradigm, there was a belief system being applied to oncology patients, and that was 
that malnutrition was an, an inevitable and an expected consequence of having cancer and going through cancer treatment. And we know now through the evidence that we've been hearing, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Evidence Analysis Library project, um, but we know now that that is an outdated paradigm. And so it's time to look for the answers of how do we move past that and um, uh, work for our patients um, much more effectively. So um, thinking about that, um, the statement, malnutrition happens, Okay, um, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about, so what are we going to do about it? Okay. So as we've uh, seen, I'm not going to elaborate on this, but um, malnutrition does occur. And of course, we know that it happens in certain diagnoses more frequently than in other diagnoses uh, throughout treatment, notably GI tract, pancreatic, head and neck cancers. Um, but it also happens in patients with all diagnoses who have late-stage disease. Um, some of the very important constructs when we're thinking about why we need to address uh, and prevent malnutrition in our cancer patients is that mild and moderate nutritional deficits are potentially reversible with nutrition intervention, where by the time that malnutrition has progressed and we're looking at severe nutrition deficits, um, they're oftentimes not reversible. And so this is a conversation that not just, it doesn't just go on with physicians or with nurses or with oncology staff, but also with patients. And it's not uncommon that an oncology dietitian will be meeting a patient for the very first time um, who is new to oncology treatment, who is already experiencing uh, decline in their nutrition status and they are on their way to a severe nutritional deficit and um, may even have uh, an attitude of, um, I would almost describe it as joy, <laughs> that they're losing weight. And so this is not an uncommon thing that uh, people do not understand. Um, and I think a lot of times the clinic and the other clinicians in the clinic don't necessarily understand that weight loss um, in a uh, high-risk cancer patient um, may actually um, create a, an irreversible situation. Um, and then lastly, um, one of the uh, important concepts that have come out in the last couple of years um, is that when patients are malnourished, when they are experiencing um, uh, poor nutrition, what can happen is that they cannot tolerate their treatment. And we keep using that term, not tolerate treatment. And what that actually means is uh, that patients will receive less treatment. So it may be difficult to take nutrition and to stratify it into how it affects outcomes and how it affects um, mortality from cancer therapy, um, but it's very easy to show that people who receive less treatment uh, are less likely to uh, either uh, be cured of their cancer or control their cancer. So very important concepts of preventing malnutrition to keep people on their uh, prescribed treatment. So the overarching goals of oncology nutrition um, is, number one, is to tolerate the treatment that is prescribed. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with cancer and you meet with the oncologist, perhaps you get a second opinion, perhaps you go to um, a nationally or internationally renowned center to get the best possible plan for your particular treatment, um, your goal is to stay on that treatment. So every time that you have a, a, a treatment hold, a treatment break um, that potentially impacts your ability to control or to cure your cancer. Um, some of the literature suggests that for every day of radiation treatment hold um, for head and neck cancer treatment, it decreases the effectiveness of the treatment by about 1%. So if you have a week, if you've lost a week because somebody's been hospitalized and they're not able to get their radiation treatment for head and neck cancer, you've potentially decreased their chance of cure or control by 5%. Many of our head and neck cancer patients start out with only a chance of 15% of cure control. So very significant. Um, in terms of chemotherapy, we're looking at the, the uh, guidelines are that about, you need about 85% of your original prescribed dosage um, to achieve um, your best control. So our goal is no breaks, no delays, no dose reductions. Um, as, as mentioned early, or earlier, um, but uh, one of our goals is early identification of pre-cachexia or cachexia states. 
um, early identification of involuntary weight loss, early identification of etiology-based malnutrition characteristics, as well as um, our goal is to address nutrition impact symptoms aggressively to protect both quality of life and the treatment plan. Um, this has been brought up previously, but uh, just wanted to uh, share some information that uh, was uh, collected by the Cancer Nutrition Research Consortium. And uh, this is just incidence of nutrition impact symptoms. And as we look at this rather lengthy list, um, one of the things I like, uh, uh, would like to say regarding the perspective of the oncology dietitian is that we're not just reacting and addressing uh, problems as they occur and potentially multiple problems as they occur so that somebody may be experiencing constipation, taste alteration, mucositis in the mouth, um, weight loss, as well as um, anorexia. So it's, it becomes very complex for people to move around these symptoms. It's something beyond which um, uh, a usual experience or a usual life experience would prepare you for. So um, one of the uh, examples I like to share with, um, uh, with staff who are training, for nursing staff who are training, for example, is that um, a natural instinct for uh, managing diarrhea, um, people have a natural instinct to just kind of stop eating because if they decrease their stimulation to their GI tract, it kind of settles down. And so uh, for uh, GI tract problems, it's very common that people will say, well, you know, go to clear liquids, stop eating and drinking for a day or two, and um, we'll go from there. But now what do we do with a cancer patient who that's their concept, that's their experience, and yet they are experiencing five weeks of diarrhea? Okay. So you can see the, the problem. Um, just wanted to kind of go over an overview. These are the uh, U.S. agencies uh, that recognize the role of nutrition service in oncology treatment. And starting with the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics um, and the National Cancer Institute, American Cancer Society, um, but all the way down through um, uh, even the Oncology Nursing Society. So nutrition is recognized as being an important part of treatment, um, but it's very ambiguous. And so when we talk about the difference, and as... Uh, uh, Dr. Eisenring will be uh, talking about shortly. The difference between the United States and several other countries is that we don't really have guidelines. We don't have overarching um, recommendations that require or even recommend um, the frequency of interaction um, or the uh, frequency of, or freedom of access to oncology nutrition services in the United States. So it's very much up to individual facilities to decide what um, and how often uh, a patient would have access to a dietitian. Um, so I uh, did serve on the original um, or on the um, oncology nutrition update work group for the evidence analysis library, which we've heard quite a bit about. And um, I just wanted to, um, uh, I guess, describe the difference between the original project, which was in 2007, and um, uh, I can't remember. I think it was somewhere around 80 to 90 um, topics were. Um, elucidated and described um, versus the 2013. Um, and so just to give you the background, um, we uh, came to the uh, work group meeting, we had our introductions, and then we were instructed, and this was our work group started during the height of the recession, that due to funding limitations, we were restricted to answering or updating only 11 of the questions um, out of the original um, I can't remember, 80 to 90 that were uh, created in the 2007, which created a flurry of discussion, <laughs> let me just say. And so we had camps that were interested in looking at the vitamins and camps that were interested in looking at all these specific issues. And um, in the meeting after the meeting, um, we actually sat down and we were like, you know, we don't even think we're all going to have jobs in the next five years. So, so let's look at what can we do with these 11 precious questions. What can we do to help to support um, oncology nutrition practice? And so that was how the focus turned to um, collecting the in information or collecting the evidence that demonstrated the value of oncology nutrition service. And if you look at the difference between the 2007 um, the majority of the questions which are represented by the grade three evidence um, and then comparing it with the evidence analysis library of 2013, which is the majority of the uh, 
of the information is represented by green, which is grade one evidence. You can see that, that the evidence over that couple of years actually, um, uh, I guess, became evident to all of us that, that nutrition now had um, a, a leg to stand on. Um, so during this meeting, um, this is actually a representation. This is the nutrition outcomes data um, put into a chart form. And as Mary Playtech had mentioned earlier, we had 45 studies that um, were, we were able to demonstrate um, the effectiveness of um, medical nutrition therapy um, in reducing or preventing hospital admissions and readmissions, hosp uh, reducing hospital length of stay, improving quality of life of cancer patients. Um, improving radiation treatment tolerance and improving chemotherapy treatment tolerance, as well as um, affecting and reducing mortality. And so uh, this chart actually was created for the work, work group during the process to try to simplify things, to help us to formulate our, our discussion, formulate our answers. And um, they were actually going to get rid of this chart <laughs> after the meeting was over. And I was like, you know, I really like that chart. Um, and I use this chart um, when I'm orienting new physicians. So I think it's just a very clear representation. Um, and we might be able to use that uh, after this meeting to be able to move forward to um, discuss this with um, people outside of the nutrition world. So today um, I wanted to talk very briefly about uh, models of care. And um, so uh, just taking a look at what are, what are the most common um, ways in which um, uh, cancer patients have access to oncology service, oncology nutrition service. And so the first uh, model that comes to mind is the hospital inpatient registered dietitian um, who is oftentimes assigned multiple floors and is working on a, um, a very tight schedule. Um, and so an outpatient oncology center will oftentimes, uh, in terms of uh, referring oncology patients, will refer to and ask for the outpatient dietitian. And I think Dr. Um, Clinton even mentioned this, that it's difficult to get the dietitian down to the, the um, outpatient cancer center. And so the, patient, or the uh, dietitian is pulled from the inpatient staff, which shorts the inpatient, um, uh, inpatients, I should say, and, um, but creates a situation where um, a kind of a negative cycle gets going, where the physician um, is, knows it's difficult to get the dietitian, um, and so they're kind of waiting until they're sure that they need to have the dietitian. Oftentimes, the patient is in an acute or a crisis type situation at that point. Um, malnutrition has been occurring over time, and now the patient is severely malnourished, and so the dietitian gets called in. So the dietitian, who already is short on time, is faced with what we like to call in our world a crash and burn consult, and, uh, which is time consuming and oftentimes not effective because it's, it's a very late in the process and not as effective as when it's early um, in the process. And so we have um, kind of this negative situation coming, going on. And then thinking about it from the patient perspective, um, the patient has uh, limited ability to recover from the malnutrition. So the patient is losing, the facility is losing, the physician is losing, the dietitian is losing. It's just a very negative situation. Um, the outpatient registered dietitians who um, are hired by either hospital or a freestanding uh, outpatient cancer center um, is, an, is a, another option. We have um, referral to hospital-based outpatient dietitians. Outpatient dietitians are often um, will we'll see people uh, once. Oftentimes, these are people who have the ability to pay as Medicare does not cover for oncology nutrition outpatient services. Um, and uh, Oftentimes, insurance doesn't cover it, or will only cover a portion of it. So basically, what we have are self-selected patients with ability to pay, um, seeing an outpatient registered dietitian. Um, we have uh, in a better situation, or a best situation, includes nutrition staff that are dedicated to outpatient oncology services. Many dietitians will have both inpatient and outpatient services. The problems with this uh, level of care is that it's often limited to a certain day of the week, which means that there will be certain patients who come in on that day, but you don't see patients who come in on the other day. Um, but it also um, is oftentimes very limited in terms of the number of hours of the number of FTE that are available to care for cancer patients. Um, and actually, we had we just had on our listserv, we have um, about 2,500 people in our group. Um, 1,500, are, I think, are on the listserv. 
And we just had a brand new dietitian who just got assigned to an outpatient oncology clinic. And uh, she was reaching out to the group, to the seasoned professionals for help and for advice of how to start, how to proceed. And it was interesting because she actually signed the very last statement in her, in her email was that she was desperate. <laughs> and it's a feeling, it's a feeling that actually is very common among oncology dietitians. And it's not desperate just because you can't see everyone, but more particularly, you can't see everyone who needs to be seen. And so it's a very desperate feeling because if you're empathetic, you, you realize that these people are being turned away and that they are going to be turning to the health food store or to the internet. Um, they're going to be turning to, um, to their neighbor, to their uh, you know, neighbor over the fence to try to find um, some relief for their symptoms. Um, and then lastly, uh, the best situation, which is having nutrition staff embedded within an oncology clinic. Um, and at this point, though, I still would like to point out that even in that situation, we do not have validated, reliable benchmarking data regarding what constitutes adequate FTE for outpatient oncology nutrition. One of the studies that uh, just recently came out, um, this is from the National Hospital Oncology Benchmark Study. Um, this is, uh, let's see, I want to say it was 58 um, centers. Um, that answered their questionnaire. And what they found is that about 24% of the facilities were um, described that they have nutritionists, but we still don't have the amount or the adequacy of that. Um, this is actually um, a picture of, at St. Luke's, a previous facility I had been working at where we had a supportive care clinic, which is a multidisciplinary clinic, um, including um, the oncology dietitian. It was funded by an NCCC grant. Um, and uh, what it did is we took the most complex patients and we saw them together in a, in a single clinic. Um, and uh, I wanted to share this information. This was published in the Journal of Supportive Oncology, um, our results. But, uh, but basically, if you take a look at what the primary referrals were to our clinic, um, it was physical symptoms, including things like mouth sores, um, but also uh, weight loss. Those were the two primary things that people were being referred to the clinic for. And then if you take a look at, these are the interventions that ha were provided and that by far um, uh, exceeding all other interventions that were required were the nutrition interventions. So when you have the dietitian present at the right time in the right type of setting, you can see that nutrition interventions are actually um, the, some of the most frequent that are required for patient care. Um, other models of care that are available in the United States, um, non-hospital based, which include specialty infusion companies, which may have a dietitian. Um, if they do, that dietitian will provide consultation for patients receiving tube feeding or TPN. Um, this does not mean that they are available to, um, uh, to other patients who do not have specialty infusion um, uh, or, do, or we're not referred to the specialty infusion company for services. Um, there are also free, or I'm sorry, for-profit freestanding oncology centers. Um, both of these will provide radiation therapy as well as chemo infusion. Um, these centers, there's no standards regarding what is required or what is available um, for oncology care. I will tell you that just recently um, in my own life, I was, have just moved and I met with an oncologist um, setting up care uh, for, uh, just for surveillance. And um, when she found out that I was an oncology dietitian, she asked me if I was looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> and what was funny is I had actually tried to apply at their, or at their, uh, their group. It's a very large group in Texas. I had tried to apply, but they had no positions because they don't have oncology dietitians. So they didn't have any positions available to apply for. So... Um, Lastly, we have um, the private practice registered dietitian nutritionists um, that are available. However, uh, the question is, would they have the resources of, uh, available to them, including information about patient, uh, you know, from the chart or from the, the center as far as what the patient is experiencing or, or what kind of treatment they're receiving? And then lastly, we have um, what many patients can turn to, or will turn to when they can't have an evidence-based oncology nutrition, which is alternative medicine providers. Other models in care, uh, we've already talked about this, but nursing-based nutrition care. Um, nutrition is part of scope of practice for nurses. Um, so uh, it is appropriate for them to be able to handle and be able to intervene in some of the early nutrition um, issues that come up for patients. However, nurses are on a minute-by-minute minute, um, uh, uh, 
procedure by procedure um, time schedule, and so there are very many time constraints, um, as well as they tend to be drawn into focusing on medication management. <clears throat> there are also, uh, if uh, no other avenues are available to a patient. There are online government, academic, and voluntary health organization resources, such as through the ACS or NCI. Some excellent resources for symptom management, and this is oftentimes where people, uh, this is the only resource that people are able to turn to to treat, basically treat themselves, treat their own symptoms. Um, and then also there is this new idea uh, burgeoning out here, of this new fee-for-service, which uh, is uh, the concept of through your smartphone having a dietitian in your pocket. Um, and so what we're looking at here is ability to pay out of pocket as well as, um, you know, uh, can we use technology to replace informed medical care? Um, and, uh, you know, what is the credibility of these resources? What is the safety? And are they appropriate for complicated oncology patients? So Colleen Gill from uh, University of Colorado had uh, done a, a survey gathering information regarding 56 uh, NCI centers. And what she did is uh, she was able to um, reach 58% or I'm sorry, 53% of the NCI centers. And she was able to compare um, between 2011 and 2013 um, the dietitian FTE compared to if you take a look at the patient numbers on the bottom of the screen and so we're looking at potentially in the far end here we have 3,000 I'm sorry three a little bit more than three dietitians full-time dietitians taking care of potentially 5,000 to 6,000 patients so clearly what would happen in this situation is only the very highest risk patients are going to receive care um, I uh, turned to our group, the Oncology Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group, recently with an online survey, and I had 177 responses, um, which uh, just taking a look at where uh, the oncology dietitians find themselves practicing. Um, and some of the questions I wanted to ask um, included, do you use a validated malnutrition screening tool to identify risk? And about just about half of the clinics um, were using a validated malnutrition um, screening tool, which um, is tremendously important because this is, this is what addresses the malnutrition is happening, what are you doing about it? If you are not screening all the patients throughout their treatment, you're going to be missing large numbers of patients. And uh, so uh, it's very important for all of the clinics to be using, and perhaps this is one of the things we'd recommend for a guideline, would be to include um, a, a validated malnutrition screening tool at each cancer center. A follow-up question to that then, thinking that 50% of them were using a screening tool, the question is, so of those people who are using this validated screening tool, are they repeating it throughout treatment? So at the moment that a patient walks through the clinic or walks through the clinic doors before they're starting their oncology tr treatment, and you ask them and you apply this validated screening tool, perhaps they are, are not quite yet experiencing malnutrition, but that doesn't mean that one week, three weeks, six weeks, 10 weeks, 32 weeks from then that they won't be. So we have to be repeating those, um, those processes. Um, I did ask the dietitians, um, do you bill for your clinic nutrition services? And more than 80% do not, which means we are dependent on the good graces of the administration to hire and to staff the dietitians adequately. Um, just asking an opinion question of, is there adequate oncology nutrition FTE to provide for your patient needs? And overwhelmingly, you can see the answer in blue, <laughs> that no, uh, most dietitians feel that there is still a great need that is identified outside of their clinic. And taking a look at what are, what are these perceived barriers um, to the, um, that you experience that prevent achieving ideal oncology nutrition care. And so overwhelmingly, it had to do with staffing, um, lack of funding, and that the dietitian, that blue color is actually the, or, I'm sorry, the darker blue is dietitian is usually consulted after, this is actually the questions themselves, but the dietitian is usually consulted only after malnutrition has occurred. So just, uh, I have to say that in doing the survey, I knew these were the answers <laughs> I was going to get, um, but I thought it was interesting to just kind of hear from the group. So um, one of the things that you'll see in the literature to this point um, regarding oncology nutrition is that there are certified specialists in oncology nutrition out there. The question, and oftentimes there'll be the website, there'll be the link, here, click here to find the board certified specialist in oncology. But the reality is if you go through that, uh, that link and you find the lists 
of the, uh, the board certified oncology dietitians, most of them are working at facilities. So if you are at a facility, so we figure what, 75% uh, of facilities don't have a dietitian available to them, an oncology dietitian available. So if you're a patient at the thousands and thousands of patients at one of those facilities, um, you are not going to be able to get an oncology dietitian by clicking this link because these people are working for a facility. So if you're not a patient at that facility, you're not going to be able to be seen. So I think that's another area that we need to kind of look towards is um, how are we going to create access to board certified oncology dietitians. I think the answer to that probably leads in the direction of requiring facilities to have some form of um, uh, specialist available. And just bringing up kind of the obvious, if a cancer patient does not have access to an oncology dietitian, dietitian who is giving that nutrition advice? Is it the store clerk? Is it the internet? Um, and at what cost? So we have not only financial out-of-pocket from the patient paying these people and paying for the different you know, supplements that are being used, but also the efficacy of treatment um, and to society. So there's just huge costs that are associated with, um, with this lack of access to evidence-based nutrition. Um, these are actual real titles and topics I pulled off of the internet. I just thought it was kind of fun. We went to the dark side here. But, um, but just, you know, these are real titles. I mean, imagine if you're the patient and you're desperate. Imagine if this is your loved one. Imagine if this is your eight-year-old child you're taking care of and you don't have this access to the patient, or I mean, sorry, to the, to the dietitian. So reversing cancer, um, a cure to advanced cancer, a summary of 30 years of clinical experimentation. Now that, that ought to horrify just about most of you there, but, <laughs> whoops. Um, and so, and just lastly, I wanted to talk about there are areas of special interest beyond just the basic care that we're already talking about. And so as, as we're presenting this information, we are talking about basic care. Nutrition is fundamental. It's fundamental to life. It's fundamental to healing. And so for cancer patients who don't have um, this basic service, it's, um, it's really a, a potentially a huge problem for them. Um, and so areas of special interest include pediatric oncology treatment, um, nutrition for pediatric survivorship, um, nutrition for sarcopenic obesity and sarcopenic weight loss, um, cachexia and precachexia, as well as adult survivorship, uh, the prevention of primary and secondary cancers, as well as um, the uh, oral chemotherapy medications, which are just swamping um, cancer treatment, um, and their multiple, multiple interactions with food and nutrients. Who better would be um, able to counsel a patient, to, to advise a patient, to listen to what the patient is actually eating, um, to make sure that their oral chemotherapy medications are not being rendered inactive okay. or suboptimal? And just lastly, um, I was asked to describe what would be the ideal situation um, for the United States oncology nutrition um, care. And so just starting out with, uh, as we've talked already quite a bit about, but identifying the nutrition staff who are dedicated to oncology service, then training and developing oncology nutrition skill sets uh, from qualified RDNs, um, developing this culture of nutrition in which all of the staff from the physician um, through the radiation therapist helping a patient off the table um, and the patient says, oh, I'm kind of weak today because I, I haven't been eating well. Okay, but developing that culture of nutrition in our cancer uh, centers so that um, everybody is, is, is on the lookout for malnutrition. Um, moving towards validated use of screening tools applied routinely at every cancer center, at every cancer clinic. Um, the use of nutrition, oncology-specific nutrition assessments, as well as implementing and using evidence-based medical nutrition therapy, as well as providing the ongoing monitoring and evaluation of, uh, for patient success. Um, and then lastly, using um, standardized, uh, uh, like the Aspen Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic Etiology-Based Malnutrition, um, grading system and the standardized oncology grading and terminology for nutrition impact symptoms. For example, the uh, common toxicity, co I'm sorry, common toxicity criteria for the adverse events, and then again, uh, doing the outcomes monitoring and the data collection. So I just want to thank you uh, for listening to me today, and um, we'll take questions in a couple minutes. I was supposed to mention, and now comes Liz <laughs> Eisenring. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much.
comments. So while I'm waiting for the presentation um, to come up, I just really wanted to um, thank the organisers for this uh, wonderful meeting and opportunity to um, come together and actually discuss this important topic. Um, I think it's a really wonderful opportunity to look at what's going well and look at how we can perhaps um, work together for, for best uh, patient care and outcomes. So what I will be talking about is looking at different nutrition pathways from an international perspective. So I will highlight a couple of examples. Okay. So the international perspective to say uh, which part of the world I'm from. So I come from the beautiful Gold Coast uh, in Queensland, Australia. We can have a look there. Um, and not only are we known for our beautiful beaches, but we do also have um, beautiful hinterland uh, rainforest as well. So I'll end this presentation by giving you a wonderful excuse uh, for having to come and visit. <laughs> Okay, so just like in the United States, in Australia, we also have um, good data to demonstrate that patients with cancer are at most risk of nutritional challenges. So these results are from um, the Australasian Nutrition Care Day survey, which was um, a study collected uh, or involving 56 uh, hospitals from Australia and New Zealand. And what we found, perhaps not surprisingly, but for patients with cancer compared with other groups within the hospital setting, were found to be 1.8 times more likely to be assessed as malnourished, as well as eating less than 50% of the offered food, and also 1.7 times more likely to have unplanned hospital admissions compared with other patient diagnostic groups. So there's no doubt that patients with cancer um, have significant nutritional challenges. To highlight that there uh, are some evidence-based practice guidelines um, that have been developed and um, I guess I've been uh, lucky enough to be involved in a whole range of um, different guidelines. We started off looking at um, nutritional management in patients receiving radiotherapy because at the time that was where most of the evidence was. We have then updated to include uh, chemotherapy but um, have also focused I guess particularly on patients with head and neck cancer because as was uh, highlighted earlier that's where a lot of the data is because they're often uh, the patients that have um, a lot of nutritional challenges going through. Also like to highlight uh, internationally the wonderful work that has been occurring. So all the sort of uh, enteral and parenteral nutrition uh, societies have been doing their, their own uh, group of guidelines. And as we've mentioned several times today, and also like to uh, acknowledge the evidence-based uh, library, which is certainly a fantastic resource, I think, for uh, identifying um, the data and evidence for particular questions. So for those of you who have been involved in the development or the um, analysis of systematic reviews and guidelines, um, I commend you. I feel your pain. I know there's an enormous amount of work uh, that goes into reviewing these papers and forming the evidence-based guidelines, but to highlight the areas where we do actually have good evidence, I think first step is always to be aware of the evidence um, in order to be able to then translate it into practice. Okay, so I've shown you um, patients with cancer have nutritional issues, we have highlighted some of the existing documents where there is evidence for the uh, nutritional management. Now talking about uh, outpatient models of care. So not surprisingly it is dependent on the type of cancer, on the type of treatment they're receiving, so whether it be surgery, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, the healthcare services and as we've also mentioned today of course uh, insurance or financial considerations um, come into play as well. So I like this, this slide. Um, talks about the benefit of care pathways 
And so starting off with a thorough literature search and being aware of the evidence, I think, is always the first step. Then I think having collaborative development. So from a multidisciplinary team approach, getting all the key uh, stakeholders involved, ideally in critiquing the evidence, but then also coming up together for developing an effective care plan. In my experience, is if you've got the whole team feeling responsible for the overall result of the care pathway, they're much more likely to ensure that it is being uh, implemented and to ensure that nutrition is on the agenda. Um, it also does promote consistency, reduce uh, variation in practice, and of course is evidence based. I think once a care pathway has been uh, developed, then it also gives us a nice baseline for data collection. So in course, uh, including all those outcome measures are incredibly important. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to focus on uh, some different models of care. I'm starting off with some from Australia. So the first is from um, the group at Princess Alexandra Hospital, led by Laura Lee Wall, who's a speech pathologist, um, just about to keep complete her PhD. So this is called the, the Screen It. And um, why I wanted to highlight this one is I think it's a good example of using the evidence, but also then taking it a step further in that the, the patient themselves and their carer can actually have input and highlight um, the areas where they would like more support. So as with actually all the models of care I'm presenting from Australia, it is in uh, patients with head and neck cancer. It involves information that's gathered from the patient and their carer uh, each visit to then triage. And I guess why this came ar around is that we had implemented um, some of the evidence-based guidelines, which had highlighted that there's pretty good evidence that um, for a patient with head and neck cancer, seeing a dietitian weekly throughout their treatment uh, was beneficial. However, I guess uh, anecdotally and from practice, we knew that you know there's some patients um, who might be all right for a couple of weeks, and then as we talk about crash and burn, there might be uh, a couple of uh, a time where they'd actually benefit from several uh, visits in one week. Um, likewise, oh, I've got this on automation. Um, likewise. There'll be some patients who can actually go a couple of weeks without treatment, others that need it much more frequently. So this was a way of actually triaging those existing resources to where they're most likely to be of benefit. Uh, it's focusing particularly on nutrition, swallowing and distress outcomes. And it truly is a multidisciplinary approach uh, led by uh, speech pathology and dietetics, but involving uh, radiation oncology, nursing, counselling and uh, psychology also. Okay, so these are a little bit hard to see, but um, just to show you, I guess, an example of some of the questions um, that patients are asked. So they get an iPad when they come in to receive radiotherapy, and uh, basically we've combined a few different validated screening tools from nutrition area, uh, speech area, and the uh, psychology psychological uh, distress uh, to help sort of triage. So there's questions on whether the patient's experienced any taste changes or any nutrition impact symptoms that have been affecting the ability to eat. There's also questions about texture, swallowing, uh, if the patient is on tube feeding, how they've been managing. Um, there's questions about weight, though we're hoping to eventually automate it so that when someone comes in for their visit, they get weighed that weight automatically gets included into here and can be used in the triage system, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and then there's also uh, focusing on the more acute changes in the past day. Have there been any changes um, to what you've been able to eat, the texture, and then also a range of topics if the, if the patient would actually like to talk about anything in particular. There's also a distress thermometer. It does focus particularly on any distress experienced by the patient during the meal time, but it does also highlight whether there's other concerns, so whether it be uh, family, financial, um, and the carer also has the opportunity to, to complete this as well, because I guess what we haven't perhaps highlighted um, so much yet is, of course, it's not just all the challenges that are experienced by the patient that 
by the patient, but of course for their loved ones and, and the carers uh, can lead to significant distress. So once again, this looks a bit complex, but um, the main point of this is just to, to highlight through an algorithm in the, I, in the iPad, it actually then um, triages patients. So those that are identified up here in the red group um, are flagged as being at greatest risk and really need to be seen um, uh, straight away. And at, at our hospital, we have a combined speech pathology and dietetic clinic, and um, so depending on where they scored higher, so also if the patient has selected particular areas of interest they'd like to discuss. Um, there's also, uh, if the patient or the carer is experiencing significant distress, that we have a pathway in which um, that can then uh, help triage care. And some of that distress might be around uh, eating and the challenges with eating. So um, we've got some guidelines about whether or not that can be addressed during the joint uh, speech pathology and dietetic clinic or whether then um, the patient immediately gets referred to a counsellor or ongoing psychological uh, support as well. And so this is the final slide for the screen it model of care, then also talks about um, both from both the patient perspective and also the carer perspective, whether they're identified as uh, high risk and how frequently this comes. So um, Loralee is just in the final stages of actually uh, evaluating the, the success and the effectiveness of the screen it uh, tool. So far, uh, both the patients and the carers are really enjoying using it. Uh, the disciplines, we're all enjoying it. I think the overall number of referrals hasn't increased, but what it has done is changed the pattern of referrals. So there'll be some patients that we probably see a bit more frequently than once a week and there'll be some that can go perhaps a couple of weeks. Um, so another two uh, models of care also in head and neck cancer. So the first one starting off by uh, Nicole Kish's group at Peter McCallum which is a cancer specific uh, hospital that we have in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, once again, there's a lot of detail, but it's really just to highlight the assessment, uh, the screening and the assessment, and then how uh, the model of care flows on from that. So once again, using uh, particular measures of whether someone's at high risk or not, and then it is actually indicating a pathway of how frequently they should be seen, whether or not they need to be considered for uh, tube feeding, and uh, what other disciplines might need to be involved. Uh, this focuses on uh, weekly appointments for head and neck cancer at high risk and then um, regular follow-up every couple of weeks or more frequently if required. Um, what we tend to have, I think, in some of our wonderful specialist clinics in Australia is pretty good care nutrition-wise in the hospital setting. I do think uh, where there often is a big gap, though, is what happens post hospital. So we do have some specialist um, outpatient clinics, um, but once again, waiting lists, very large. And then do we go to the private practitioners? And um, the challenge that we have there is the private practitioners are often doing more lifestyle uh, modification. So they're more familiar with, um, you know, helping people uh, to lose weight or manage their diabetes. So if they get a very complicated head and neck cancer case, um, having the resources um, to help them manage that. What we're starting this year uh, at our facility are actually specialist outpatient um, clinics. So it's, it's actually associated with a university, not a hospital. Uh, patients will have to pay just as they pay to see a private dietitian. But the difference is, opposed to seeing a dietitian that might only see a complicated cancer patient, you know, in one, one of every 50 patients, this will actually be someone, probably um, a consultant from one of the local hospitals that will come and do some specialist clinics. Okay, and the final head and neck uh, model is from uh, Teresa Brown's group in Royal Brisbane Hospital. And so this is once again, looks at, a, ooh, looks at a, a range of measures, what type of cancer the patient has, if they're at higher risk, for example, having um, chemo rays, chemotherapy and radiation therapy concurrently. Why this came about and why I think this is a nice protocol, it was really to help try and streamline decision-making around the use of prophylactic 
pegs or tube feeding. And I'm not sure how it is uh, here in the US, but in Australia, it tended to be dependent on the interest of the clinician. So we'd have some clinicians who are very pro-peg and want to put a peg in everyone and would have others that um, you know, see it as, as an absolute last resort. Um, so this is a really nice multidisciplinary way of coming together to help try and have a bit more of an evidence-based and consistent use for decision-making around the use of prophylactic pegs. Okay, now we're moving on to Europe with um, the Netherlands and I'd like to highlight the work of Hinky and the Dutch uh, Malnutrition Steering Group. And so this has really come out of some of their work around uh, managing uh, malnutrition in, in Dutch hospitals. So this is their 10 steps, the ones I wanted to highlight and it's come out a couple of times now. So I think hopefully one of the take home messages from today is starting and getting some agreement around evidence-based validated nutrition screening tools is a really good place to start. And at least it can help identify those patients who would uh, benefit of nutrition risk and it's a nice way of monitoring as well. So they have their own um, simple nutrition screening cook tool they use called the SNAC and then have basically that same sort of flow chart and decision making based on whether someone's at high risk or not. And um, what I did want to include, I thought this was interesting. So they did some work around what are the challenges um, around the sort of the outpatient, but then also what happens once a, a patient finishes cancer treatment. And I guess not surprisingly, they also had the similar challenges of who do they refer to? So often they have uh, good access to an oncology dietitian in the hospital, but what happens once they've finished treatment? There's also those same challenges as whether the private practitioner dietitian has the expertise and the gaps in uh, communication and, um, and proper, I guess, discharge planning and handover from the, the medical team. Um, they then uh, put together a particular pathway and what I think is very useful is put together a toolkit of a whole range of different tools and resources with the idea of upskilling uh, some of the private practice, private practice dietitians in the community that would then be seeing some of these complicated cancer patient cases that they might not have seen uh, otherwise. And finally, I'll just include uh, this. And I was really excited to know that you actually don't need to learn Dutch. It's all in English, which was a, a great relief to me. And it's a really, I think they've done a great job at putting together a nice website and they've got a whole range of different tools. So I certainly encourage you to, to check this one out. And so finally, on the, win on the uh, worldwide tour of um, examples for models of care, I wanted to end with um, this from uh, Dr. Martin Chasen's group in Canada. And this particular example is about the, the pivot study, but it's looking at a multidisciplinary rehabilitation clinic for patients with cancer. And I love that the patient is the centre of the model, as is their carer, and that it is a true multidisciplinary team, including the dietitian, occupational therapists, doctors, oncologists, psychologists, social worker, nursing, uh, physiotherapy. So really all the, all the different disciplines. So with this particular study, it um, was an eight week intensive program, including uh, seeing the physiotherapist for exercise treatment a couple of times a week. Uh, a whole battery of uh, outcome assessments uh, were measured and uh, based on the different uh, nutrition impact symptoms, it was um, those were used to guide the nutrition counselling sessions by the dietitian. And so they've published this and, and not surprisingly, I guess, found that there certainly were benefits from this multidisciplinary cancer rehab uh, clinic. Uh, patients loved it and they wanted, wanted to continue with it and certainly the... Um, improvements in nutrition, physical function and quality of life, um, I think were quite impressive. So to end in, so this is, you know, if you're in Outback Australia, the classic thing you see is basically kilometres in 
any direction, lots and lots of big dis distances. So uh, as was mentioned this morning, and Dr Clinton said, I, you know, we've actually got some pretty good evidence and certainly there are some guidelines and, and in particular groups, head and neck, gastro, a uh, little bit emerging now in lung. We've actually got some pretty good evidence. Let's be aware of it. Um, and let's now, the challenge we have though is implementing it, translating it into practice. And, um, you know, so for a summary from my session, I'd like to highlight that yes, we know that patients with cancer have significant nutritional challenges and impacts not just for the patient but for the care of themselves. For many patients, cancer can now be seen as a chronic condition. And so we're talking about the nutrition requirements that do change over the continuum of care, the acute time during treatment versus what happens then in the cancer survivorship and, and minimising the risk of cancer recurrence or other sort of lifestyle diseases. There are um, some international guidelines available, which I think are a good starting point as a group for deciding, um, you know, what are the next steps. Um, we've touched on a couple of examples of models of care and from some groups that I think are doing a great job. And um, for me, you just have to look in the past 10, 20, 30 years, what improvements there are in surgical techniques, chemotherapy regimens and radiation treatment. So it's incredibly important, I think. Nutrition is a fundamental right. It's um, important to see the benefits of any of these medical treatments. Um, you know, nutrition has to be there. So as all the anti-cancer treatments continue to evolve, I think it's incredibly important that the nutrition care does as well. Now, I promised you I'd give you an ex uh, a good reason to visit Australia. And here it is. Um, the MASC, which is the Multinational Association for Supportive Care in Cancer, is a wonderful international and multidisciplinary group. Its conference news usually alternates between the US and uh, Europe each year, but for the first time ever in the 25-year history, it's in Adelaide in Australia in June this year. Um, so I'm going to forward some information, I think, to Katrina that can be uh, forwarded. And um, not that the Gold Coast, it's, it's not exactly on the way to Adelaide, but it's pretty close. So if you want to come and have a bit of a visit and tour our facilities, um, I'm very happy to, to welcome you and, and show you about. Thank you. All right, thank you both so much for great presentations. We will be having a question and answer session and a panel session. However, um, we would like to invite a sp special first panelist up to speak. Um, we are very lucky today to have Diana Dyer with us, and many of you will recognize her as a good friend and colleague, um, as I do. Diana is a registered dietitian in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but what she really brings that I think is special to the discussion is that she's also a two-time breast cancer survivor, as well as a survivor of neuroblastoma as a child. Um, Diana combines her personal experience and professional experience to focus her efforts on increasing awareness of the benefits of proactively including nutrition as a component in true comprehensive cancer care. And so I'm going to invite Diana up to give a few comments and then we'll move on to question and answer. Well, let's see if we can get my slides up, but thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. To say this gives me great happiness would be the understatement of the year. Okay, let's. Yes, okay, technology works. Um, again, thank you. I am here as a, wearing many hats. So certainly the cancer survivorship aspect that I bring, and it, in contrast to the world tour that we've just had, you know, thank you very much, Liz. I mean, this would be a very personal tour, and it will be the thumbnail sketch, okay, because I can't possibly cover everything that um, has been a part of my life as a childhood cancer survivor, as um, was just mentioned, in addition to not just all, uh, subsequent other cancer diagnoses, but I have the chart like this, if it were in hard form, of all the late effects, all the complications, all the comorbidities that actually have gone or as a result of cancer therapies. 
So I am here as a representative for both cancer patients, but also every dietitian here in the audience, on the web, and those who are not able to attend. So as I said, I'm skipping over a whole lot to actually show you um, my last family picture before my second breast cancer diagnosis. Um, this was a second primary. I have had, as I said, like have just sort of like in marching step, had all of these problems. All of this was just the next cancer. And I went through my therapy, and I thought, what do I do now? I went to my oncologist, my first post-chemo visit, and asked, said, I've done everything you've asked me to do. What do I now do to help myself? And my oncologist, a brilliant man, a wonderful physician, looked at the floor. And he looked at the floor for quite some time before he finally looked up and his eyes met mine. And there was not much to say other than, well, eat right and exercise. And I looked at him and thought, wow, I'm on my own. Because even as a dietitian, this was hard. I was not an oncology specialist. I had spent 20 years in the ICUs with nutrition, you know, nutrition um, critical care support. So my first phone call, because I was on my own, I was as lucky as could be, was to my friend Cheryl Rock. <laughs> How lucky was that? So Cheryl got me started, but basically I continued trying to piece this together from myself. This was the mid-90s, before the internet. Okay? So it was, in that sense, <coughs> A, a reduced complication, but maybe an enhanced complication. So it was really, it was um, quite the journey. And so here I am, a patient floundering by herself, you know, in the, tr in the trenches as a patient, besides working, um, and a re medical reporter for a medical writer from the um, Detroit Free Press calls me up one day out of the blue and says, would you like to be, or like, may I interview you for an upcoming story we're doing in the free press about the race for the cure? And very naively, I said, sure. <laughs> With no concept that this article would be anything other than a small article in a big paper buried. But no, she made it into a big article, um, even partially on the front page, above the fold of the Detroit Free Press, and overnight, my life changed. And we know that that article went around the old fashioned wire service, <laughs> downloaded and printed in over 60 newspapers. And how do we know this? Because over 1,500 people found my home phone number and called me. <laughs> the interesting point is yes, they were all saying that what I had provided information in this article provided them hope. And the first hope that many of them had said they'd had, but here's the second message. They were angry, angry that this information was not being provided by them as part of their comprehensive cancer care from their own cancer team. This made no sense to them. Well, that wasn't a research study, and it wasn't a planned focus group, but boy, people let me know what they actually um, what they felt was important. People put me in private practice. Two days later, I was seeing people, seriously. Um, they asked me to write a book. What did I know about writing a book? Nothing, zero. I'm an ICU dietitian. <laughs> All I knew how to do was pull up labs on a computer at that point. But that is when I became an advocate, overnight. And here I am, almost 20 years later. So yes, I wrote a book. Um, no, I knew I did not know how to write a book, but I wrote a book. It is still in print. I donate the proceeds of it to AICR, as we've heard about this morning, to fund you know research that is focused on nutrition and cancer survivorship. And at this point, you know, and that's where proceeds are donated. It's still, as I said, still in print and still selling. And so, what did this do? It launched me into a, out of the trenches, <laughs> into this much bigger world. And yes, I went into private practice, but pretty soon I was invited to speak 
doing grand rounds here and there, doing big cancer survivorship events, essentially raising the awareness of the need and benefit from nutrition and cancer survivorship, let alone, I mean, starting from day, the day of diagnosis forward. I mean, really, this took me all over the country, and it's only because of the short amount of time I have that I can't give example after example of what I saw, what I heard, essentially what not to do. <laughs> okay, what wasn't working. But the real point I want to end here on, on this slide is that, yes, I was in private practice. I had a waiting list months long, people flying from all over the country to see me. Doubling my rates did not reduce this waiting list. <laughs> but why did I leave it? Because I overheard a comment one day by an oncologist at a meeting where I knew many of them who said, we don't have to do anything in our cancer center. We have Diana locally in private practice. That's when my world, I came out of those trenches. I saw a much bigger picture then, realized I was enabling essentially cancer centers by not having a dietitian on staff, embedded, integrated, whatever word you want to choose, able to see these medical records, able to share back and forth with the entire team. Oh my gosh, was it the scariest thing imaginable being on my own <laughs> with these patients with no medical records. Many of them did not even want me to call their physician because their oncologist had already told them, don't waste your time on nutrition. So I had to do that, as I said, that changed my perspective and I realized I had to try and do something on a much larger scale to try and identify barriers, break down barriers. Yeah. So anyhow, wow, you know, I don't know the, what I've personally accomplished, but as a group, the fact that we are here today is an uh, amazing step forward. This is not a pretty picture because the data up here we've already gone over today is not pretty data in terms of what cancer patients are coming to their diagnosis with, all the chronic diseases, the comorbidities they already have, and now they're at increased risk for even more of them. The cost of all of this, the number of patients who are affected and impacted is astronomical. I mean, and we really, we just cannot go on, you know, with this. 86% of our healthcare costs, you know, are going to chronic disease, and we just cannot sustain that. Oops, wait, wait, there was a bullet point here. Where was it? Oh. Yes. To reiterate what we've heard this morning, cancer does not happen in a nutritional vacuum. How difficult is this? This is difficult for me uh, as a dietitian with all the comorbidities that I am also managing and trying to keep nutritional balls in the air along with reducing my risk for recurrence. So we know, and it is not a belief system, we know that chronic disease, that the whole nexus, the link here between prevention and treatment is food. And yet what do we have? We have this perception which has multiple truths to it in the public that the people are fed by a food industry which pays no attention to health and a health industry which pays no attention to food. That is painful. That is painful for me to look at. It is painful for me to say I straddle. I mean, I'm a full and equal partner in each side of this. Wendell Berry, if you don't know, is a uh, farmer, poet, activist, and um, um, a Humanities Medal Award winner here in this country. So here's what we know. Look at all these foods or Bio, you know, bioactive constituents of foods that all are decreasing the activity of cancer stem cells. Why aren't we using this information? For the question on soy that came up earlier, here's genistein right here. I'm going to now, like, just even just look at, you know, blueberries here, raspberries, whatever. Why aren't we using this information? Thinking of those polyphenols from blueberries. Again, anti-cancer activity, even focusing on cancer stem cells. Food is not just food. So we as dietitians are in the perfect role to be helping patients even understand where they have food choices, which foods are going to be more impactful. I love this. A half a purple potato. <laughs> 
as the same amount of these cancer-fighting molecules as three and a half of your Yukon Golds, 600 potato chips. I wish they'd had kale chips in there. But then we go on, you know, to our fruits here also. We've asked all the right questions this morning. You know, who benefits? How do we pay for this? Is cancer a teachable moment? And even when, you know, in that process. But please don't get stuck on these questions. Don't let them limit us. Don't let them be the easy answer out, the easy answer to know, just because they are difficult to address with full data. But please, we, yes, we, I'm, I'm a data geek like everyone else. We do have to keep working on these. But it's time that we actually understand that it is the right thing to do. Patient feedback is loud and clear. It is the right thing to do. And not just because it is, you know, we have to move forward on this, not just because it's the right thing to do. It solves problems. Nutritional oncology solves problems. We've heard them all iterated this morning. Let me just review a portion of the Hippocratic Oath for all of us here with regard to healing the sick. It is the responsibility of the physician to be ordering the right diet. And of course, however you want to phrase it, however it's translated, first do no harm. The motto from our dietitian's pin from the academy translates to, to benefit as many as possible. Who isn't on that side? I'm sure everyone in this room is. And just to bring it together, this African proverb, if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. It's time to travel together. And here's our toolbox. We have it. We have everything from medical nutrition therapy to understanding how to sort through either the little paper bag of dietary supplements, the grocery bags, and I had patients bring me suitcases. Suitcases, rolling them into my office when I had my private practice. Do we have credentials? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, every, many people in this room have worked very, very hard to get that CSO, you know, credential for us. But where I personally now am putting my time and effort is on the sur both survivorship aspect, but also the prevention aspect, and that is with gardening. Okay, we do have a full farm at the um, St. Joe's Hospital here, and I will just highlight my dietetic intern, now registered dietitian, who has finally, her name is Nicole, been hired as the first registered dietitian for the on outpatient oncology section at St. Joe's Hospital. She, she is going to do things there once she gets her feet on the ground. This slide over here, this little picture, uh, Harvest for Health, is a study that I am helping to fund through my endowment at AICR, um, helping Wendy DeMarc Wanafried at the University of Alabama, doing a gardening intervention with breast cancer patients. They are doing, of course, the psychosocial you know, outcomes, the physical outcomes, and then also the, where we need them, the biochemical you know, parameters, what's improving after a year of gardening. And so, I know Ohio State is doing wonderful work there too. And so it's, um, and there's probably many, many more. But I love this, life begins the day one plants a garden. And that certainly is a message that resonates with cancer, cancer patients. Just one comment here, circling back to Wendell Berry, based on what I'm doing now, to be interested in food, but not in food production is clearly absurd. And my mantra here, you know, and the whole reason we really started a certified organic farm, it's what I'm doing now, is the President's Cancer Panel uh, workshop on a you know, publication in reducing environmental cancer risk. And it's not just to reduce potential carcinogens, but again, to enhance the intake of the polyphenols, which we now know do, um, do happen with organic agriculture. Another bullet point. This is more than a call to action. I just learned this term 
BHAG at the Farms Food and Health Conference up in Traverse City, Michigan. It comes from the business world. It is a big, hairy, audacious goal. <laughs> and that is what we are calling for here now. It is more than just a call for action. And yes, implementation is critical. So there is a way to yes. I know something about that. Okay, you know, I know something about getting through those first no's and we're going to find a way to yes. And again, I want to thank the IOM. I want to thank everyone on the planning committee, all my colleagues, you know, from all over that are here in this room and all over the, the country. Thank you very much. All right, so we will have some time to take at least a couple of questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, please make your way over to the microphone. I'm going to jump in before someone gets up there and just ask, um, in uh, particularly to Liz to my right, as you look at the care plans around the world and the financing for the care plans, I'm wondering if you could comment how different healthcare systems incorporate or support RD uh, care. Is it, you can hear me? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the healthcare system does impact on things. So, some of the models of care, um, in particularly in the Australian uh, setting, were in uh, publicly funded public hospitals, um, and in actual fact. We have higher FTEs of dietitians in those publicly funded hospitals than we do in our private uh, settings generally. So that perhaps is also why we have better models of care in that in that particular setting because most of the costs are you know paid for. Where we have the gaps then is when the the user pays or the patient has to pay. And I think that's where the challenges lie. We also have the same challenges in that, um, you know, some medical insurance partially pays uh, for dietitian visits, not always. We do have in our um, Medicare scheme um, up to five visits a year for chronic conditions, including cancer. So um, we're working with GPs to try and maximise some of those. But to me, I guess I think there's two issues. There's one, let's look at the evidence, let's see what the best model of care is. Let's go to, um, um, you know, to the big, hairy, audacious goal. I love that. Let, let's do that. The second thing, I guess, is, is feasible and um, realistic. How can we make it work within the financial things? And I guess the other thing, finally, I just want to mention is we do need to do more health economic and include um, health economic um, outcomes in our nutrition studies, which traditionally I don't think we've done terribly well. And, you know, just for example, we're, we're doing a, a trial on ginger for chemotherapy induced nausea at the moment, but use, you know, designing it like a beautiful pharmaceutical trial. So it's a beautiful study. Um, and if you look at the health um, economics, you know, the, the comparing that with some of the um, anti emetics and whatever, uh, it's tiny. Tiny, tiny costs. So I think doing more uh, health economics is really important. It's a perfect segue to our next session Thank after you. lunch today where we will be talking about some of those cost-benefit analyses. So I'll take a question from over here. Um, thank you guys. It's been great speaking so far. Um, I just have a question more so related to um, if you could just give us or me your opinion on I do more outpatient counseling in a multi-specialty um, practice. And so I'm not in the trenches anymore. I used to be. But um, oftentimes I get the question about gluten and sugar and cancer or tumors and, and tumors feeding off of sugar, gluten. I mean, when you speak to physicians, they'll say, and I'm talking about, you know, the healthy, uh, maybe remission cancer patient or somebody who's fully functioning to eat, swallow, you know, um, fully functioning and they still avoid, you know, gluten and sugar. And so um, a lot of the physicians, I don't think have a lot of information either. And a lot of times they tell the patients, just eat whatever you want. It's more important to stay well nourished. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's coming up later, but nobody's really talked a little bit about, you know, organic farming and organic food, but how about gluten or sugar, simple sugars? I, 
I you. think you just brought up a good example about why specialty oncology trained people are needed because there is so much confusion among the health care providers and obviously also among the patient care population. I don't think this is the right arena to get into the details of discussing these kinds of issues. There's a huge amount of science and evidence behind that. And your expert, having the expert of the oncology nutrition specialist would be the answer to that question. But this really isn't the arena to get into those kinds of details. Okay. Yeah, we will um, have the lunch break where it might be an opportunity for people to network about specific oncology questions. Um, in the interest of time, because we are going to go just a little bit over, if that's okay. Um, I would like to focus on questions specifically related to models of care. Um, do we have any questions from the web participants? Yes, we do. Um, uh, I'm being selective here, but um, we have a question from Michelle Kupich, who is an RDN in San Francisco, and she asks, can any of the speakers or panelists comment on the emergence of medical homes for oncology care, uh, such as patient-centered medical homes, and about the involvement of RDNs in this model? I, Rowan is our expert, and I'm not sure that she has um, any thoughts of this. I'm not. I'm actually um, would be happy to open it up to anyone in the audience who might have some ideas as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think this has reached Ohio, uh, <laughs> but I would expect that it might start out west, and and I think like anything. You know, it really gets down to the question of if there is a different system that is going to be implemented with the hypothesis that this will improve the care of those individuals that participate, you need to measure the outcomes. And I think it gets down to uh, evidence-based uh, recommendations and uh, this new idea or concept, I think, like others, the uh, warrants being looked at and tested, and how you integrate the food and nutrition into it. There's many, many different ways that that could be done. Perhaps some of our speakers in the next session will have some ideas about some of those models as well. Take a question from the other side. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Ayanata. I'm from Saber Health. Once again, thank you guys. The pr presentations have been truly phenomenal today. So as some of you may know, we're trying to be the pioneers in kind of the technology-driven solution for cancer patients and striving to improve access to oncology nutrition. So I'm curious, for those of you participating today, if you have an opinion on how kind of telemedicine and technology will impact oncology nutrition care in the future, obviously not as a replacement for an in-person oncology RD, obviously that's the most optimal, but how we can use and leverage technology to augment that. All right, I'll push the button. Listen, if you think about how we manage people in the outpatient setting, one of the most important things that you have to know if you are to counsel a person in a way that is unique to them, you have to know what they're doing. So the technology that's coming along, whether it's something you wear or something that takes a picture of everything you eat, has enormous potential to give you instant data on what you're consuming and to compose some kind of dietary pattern so that when you sit down to counsel an individual, you have their data, not some guesstimate based on, you know, a food diary that is partially filled out. Um, so the technology to, to give us the information you need to work with an individual is advancing rapidly. And I think uh, these tools are going to be wonderful uh, to, to use in the clinics. So how you then build in not just the assessment part, but feedback mm -hmm. that is more quick and instantaneous. Um, you know, all of this is, is out there and I think offers great potential. 
I'll just jump in and add that the researcher in me would advocate for collecting that data somehow to feed back towards our evidence base ultimately. But I agree. I think, um, you know, in the early days of some of this technology, it may not have been what we may think is optimal in terms of interactions with individuals. But I think the technology is really changing and very, very quickly. So I think that that opens up a lot of possibilities. And I know that there are some HIPAA compliant programs that are out there now. Um, which potentially, I guess, could answer uh, some of the issue as far as being able to access people's records and things. Um, and I will say that regarding technology within an institution, um, my St. Luke's job in Idaho was actually, we actually covered uh, multiple clinics across the entire state using technology. So that's probably, I think, more readily available at this point versus um, uh, moving outside of your facility. So you need to collect that data. <laughs> I think you do still have issues with staffing um, regardless and doing the one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe, again, there's other models for doing classes and that type of thing. All right. Uh, why don't we take one more question from this side? So I work at the Children's Hospital here in D.C., and I'm one of those inpatient dietitians that's pulled outpatient to go see patients as they come up. But from what I'm aware, there's no validated screening tool in pediatrics. So do you have any guidelines on how to increase getting into clinic and seeing patients that are at the biggest need? Before I hand over, I will just say I do know there is an Australian group that's just at the final stage of validating something, so I'm happy to that would be send wonderful. that yeah. through. Um, that's about all I can say on that. I don't do peds. <laughs> Um, I would just say, so actually in my move uh, across country, I've just taken a position as a pediatric oncology dietitian. And um, so one of the very first things I've been doing is kind of researching the background of where do you start. And I was really pretty surprised, actually, that there isn't more information related to pediatric oncology. And so that, that will be the ONDPG's next project. <laughs> that would be great. We'd be very appreciative. <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm certain that there are more questions out there, and I apologize that we need to cut this short, but I think it's been a great session. So we are now going to break for lunch, and if everyone could return to this room at 1 o'clock. <laughs>